in my work, I was photographing animals and traveling to um, Africa, among other places, to find the animals. So I, I needed to learn, and I wanted to know more about the animals. So one time I picked, went to the library, and I picked a book called Giraffes in the Wild. And I thought it would be really helpful for me to learn about the behavior of giraffes, and how long they live, and what they eat. And I started to read the book. And on one side, there was a photograph. And on the other side, there was information. And in the very first photograph, I saw two tall giraffes. And behind them, I saw a metal wire fence. And I thought that's a little strange because the book is called Giraffes in the Wild. Then I went to the next page and there was a beautiful mom giraffe and a baby. And behind them, I could see power lines. And I checked the title yet again to see that it was called Giraffes in the Wild. And I was very confused. So I went to the third page and there were four giraffes. The sun was setting behind them and I could see a parking lot and cars and buses in the parking lot. So I put that book away. I read my boys another book. And then after they went to sleep, I went to see what was going on in that book. And I looked and I looked. And finally, in the back of the book, there was a little note that said all the photographs were made in a zoo. And I didn't think that was right. I, I really didn't think it was honest. So at that point, I decided that I was going to try to tell stories about animals and about different cultures and people, but I had to actually go to those places to meet the people and meet the animals. So I began a series of books called The Traveling Photographer. So I want to share with you some of the photographs that I've made in my travels and talk a little bit about how I decide what is going to go into a book. So we're gonna switch gears and I'm gonna share my screen and still be talking with you. Let's share that. And play that. Is that working? Everything good? You see that image there? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So my work yes. and life as a photographer and a writer and a storyteller has taken me around the world many times. And sometimes as a wildlife photographer, things can get a little interesting. I've been chased by hippos. I've eaten an orange with an orangutan. I've moved close to a mountain gorilla. I've cuddled with bear cubs. I've gazed with gazelles. I've stampeded with stallions. I've locked eyes with a lion. I've paraded with peacocks. I've been splashed by the tail of a whale. And I've sat with seals. I've picnicked with a panda. I've run alongside elephants. And sometimes I've even had to run for my life. And then I take time to look at my photographs as stories and narratives. And I add words to my pictures and publish many of them as books. So there are many reasons that I love to tell stories with photographs. 
Photographs help me remember all the places I visit and the interesting people that I get to meet. Photographs help me to share different cultures and engage with people whose lives are so different than mine. Photographs help me to record moments of nature and beauty. I was recently in Kenya to start working on a book about rhinos, an animal that has been overhunted so much that it is now close to extinction. And I got to meet a very special rhino named Sudan. Sudan is the last remaining male northern white rhino on earth, the last of his species. And that's going to be one of my next books because I think that story of watching the end of a species is so important to tell. Sudan was calm and welcoming even to me. So obviously as I travel, I need to carry cameras and equipment, but I'm nothing like this style. I like to travel a bit lighter. And although I photograph animals, I would never do what this photographer is doing because I think most animals are smarter than this and they're certainly smarter than this. So photographs can tell stories. I wish I had taken this photograph. I didn't. All the other photographs I showed you, I had made. But I like this photograph so much because it tells an entire story in one single image. I know it's probably a setup and there was some Photoshop reworking done. And it's not just a random lucky moment, but the idea of composing all of the elements of a little story into one image is quite brilliant. So when I make a new book, as a storyteller, I have to think about what do I want to show? Do I want it to be funny or scary or maybe happy? or sad. So the shaping and editing of the story, those skills are important to me as the skill of making the photographs in the first place. So I want to show you a book that I'm working on now. This is a work in progress. It's a book I'm thinking of calling Monkey Zone. It's about a town where monkeys live. So as I make the photographs and as the author, I get to choose which photographs I use. So I can choose photographs that would make this story a little bit creepy or dark and empty with no people. I can use photographs that might be a little scary or look like a place that's being invaded by wild monkeys and taken over by hungry monkeys. And I watch and I tell the story of the monkeys taking over this town, overcoming the people as the monkeys arrive in a gang. So I collect all this information, all of this raw material, the different sides to the story, and then I'm in control of which story I want to tell. And it's the same thing when you have a writing assignment or something you're writing for fun, you get to decide what are those details that will change the mood? But I don't want to leave a scary story. So I want to show you another way I can tell the same story. So here's another version 
of monkey zone. So remember, I made all the photographs at the same time in the same location over the same days. But by editing, I can make two different stories. This time, I want to make the story more fun. I want to make it more happy. And one way I do that is by including more people. So I can show the monkeys interacting with people and even the monkey who's tried to steal my tripod. And I can show the monkeys accepting treats from people that come to visit them. And watch as the monkeys eat and drink. I can even add a photo of the monkeys playing and eating some healthy foods and finding some other monkeys. Or having sweets at a party. And of course, time for a bath. So there's an example of some of the decisions that I have to make as an author. And in this case, I think I'm gonna end up going with the happy, upbeat story. But maybe after I finish showing my other photographs, I'll hear from you which of those two versions of the story you liked better. So sometimes I don't exactly know what story I'm going to tell. But I'm always looking for new stories to tell about elephants. I love elephants. And I have done three books already about elephants. So can you imagine having your own elephant? Can you imagine as an elephant, as a pet in your very own family? Can you imagine an elephant in your backyard? So in most of our neighborhoods, elephants are way too big to keep at home. And most of us don't have elephants in our gardens or driveways. But a few lucky people do have their very own elephants. And there's a small village in Thailand where friendly elephants walk around, coming and going as they please. Here in this community, people and elephants all live together. This village is called Bantaklan, and people come from all over the world to watch and even ride on these smart and strong elephants. Many people in Bantaklan devote their lives to caring for these elephants and training them to welcome guests and show off their many talents. So one night, a gifted elephant trainer named Pai woke up to hear his elephant, her name was Double Gold, howling. Her moans woke up all the elephants in the village and all the elephants started to roar and the town was wild with noise. I had watched this elephant grow bigger and bigger for almost two years and he, was, he knew that she was ready to add a new baby to his family. But little did he know just how big his family would become. Double Gold roared and roared until a healthy baby elephant was born. And then she laid her head down, exhausted. But then just minutes later, Double Gold lifted her body and pierced the quiet sunrise with another loud howl. What was going on? Elephants usually only had one baby. And all of a sudden, another elephant was born. Twins, what was going on here? In this small village, the only known pair of boy elephant twins in the entire world 
had just been born. No one had ever seen twin elephant babies before. And after a few minutes of shock, Pai the trainer began laughing with joy. And soon everyone else joined in cheering and whooping and hollering together as they celebrated this miracle of the only two boy twin elephants in the whole wide world. They celebrated together all morning until the sun was shining so bright over their rice fields. And the warm rays of morning sunlight turned the whole town gold. So these two boys got their names, Gold Light and Gold Ray. I had been to this village many times before to make another book about elephants. And Pai asked me if I wanted to do a book about his new family. And of course, I said yes, double yes, twins yes. I never expected to be the official baby photographer for the world's only boy twin elephants. But here I was watching them grow up. Every morning, the brothers drink gallons and gallons of their mom's milk before they go off to elephant nursery school. The two twins are now very active and very different elephants. Pai trains the twins every day, so when they grow up, they can take visitors for rides through the little roads and rice fields of their village. They go to school to learn how to stop and go, turn left and turn right at Pai's command. Like so many twins, it's really hard to tell them apart. Yet they are such different little boys. All through the hot day, Pi brings them buckets of cool water. Gold Ray sips slowly and carefully, while Gold Light takes huge gulps and slurps and burps while he drinks. Gold Ray loves to follow Pi's voice and proudly sits, stands, or rolls over. But Gold Light would rather be playing and he tugs on his brother every chance he gets. Sometimes he even steps on his brother's belly. Gold Ray may seem calm and serious, but he is fast. And when the two boys take their daily run, Gold Ray leaves his slow poke brother behind in the dust. And then to brag a bit, Gold Ray rubs his nose in Gold Light's face. Elephants have very rough, thick skin that's wrinkly and dotted with wiry black hairs. Bugs and insects like to crawl into the skin, which can be very itchy and uncomfortable. At least twice a day, the twins come to swim in the river. Swimming and snorting and climbing over each other, all that water helps to clean out those big bunches of bugs that live in their deep folds and wrinkles. Gold light and gold ray splash and spray and point their chunks, chunks like little squirt guns. And when Pi leads them out of the water, they're very clean and shiny. But not for long. They roll in the dirt again, what a mess. But hey, that's what elephants like to do, especially these baby boys. Double Gold is a very good mother. She teaches them how to behave and be kind to one another. And when the boys play too rough or start fighting, she slips her long trunk between them and pushes one away. They're still learning just how strong their long trunks can be and just how much power they have in their round, chubby bodies. Sometimes when the boys are playing, they knock each other over by accident, but mom is always right there, checking to make sure everything is all right. And they always snuggle and make up. In the afternoon, when it is very hot, Double Gold sprays herself with a cloud of red dirt. She shows her boys how a shower of dust can help keep them cool. The dirty crust is an elephant sunblock, protecting them from the harsh direct light. 
The boys love the dust shower, and it's a time when their mom encourages them to stay messy. Gold Light and Gold Ray are learning and getting smarter every day. Their constant climbing and bumping and chasing and running and pushing is all part of growing, growing up and learning how to be good elephants. At the end of each long day, they take a last walk. And then the twins lay down for sleep, snuggling under the stars. Their two trunks twisted together, softly snoring sweet songs. But there may still be some mischief left. Gold Ray lays down so ready for night-night, but Gold Light plops down right on top of his brother, using Gold Ray's warm backside as a giant pillow. But soon the twins cuddle together and fall fast asleep. Good night, elephant twins. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for being such good watchers and listeners. And I would be thank you. And now I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. And they could be about um, the works in progress that I showed you or the elephant twin books or any of the other places or photographs that I shared with you. So if um, if you can, Ahmed, can you moderate the yes. question for us? Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, Rafa. Uh, if you would like to ask your question, yeah, please. So when you were photoing the monkeys, were you afraid they would attack you? You know, when I go to photograph wild animals, I always have a guide with me. I always have somebody like Pi, the elephant trainer who knows those animals and how they're going to behave and also what I have to do to stay safe. So oh. I was not afraid because I had uh, trainer. An, expert, an expert with me to help uh, advise me on what was safe. Okay. Okay, next. Kanaditra Desari. Next question. Kanaditra Desari, please ask your question. Okay, next, Raisa. I, oh, so if, so if you um, photograph something, when you photograph something, what if like, is there, usually, oh, okay, I missed my question. <laughs> okay, if you remember, we'll come back. Okay, the next question from Katerina Victoria. Okay, no, Katerina? It's Ka it's Katerina. Oh, Katerina, yes. <laughs> um, I can see what she's hearing. What's your question, Catherine? She's at school, so I don't know if she can hear clearly. Um, Mr. Richard, she said you could take every single one of the elephant photos. Uh, yes, I did take all the photos. The only photo in all the photographs that I showed you that I didn't take is I didn't take that photo of that vase getting knocked over in that gallery. And I didn't take the photo of me with Sudan the rhino. Sudan's trainer uh, and keeper took that took that photo. So all the other photos I showed you, I did take. Okay, next question, Keninsa. So how could you take photos without getting hurt? Well, I, sometimes it looks like I'm very close to an animal, but I may actually have a telephoto lens. I have a long lens that makes it seem like I'm closer. 
So that's one way that I could be safe. Another way is sometimes I might be in a vehicle. I could be in a car or a truck, and that's how I stay safe. And other times I wait till um, whoever's guiding me says, okay, it's safe, that animal is quiet, or that animal is resting, or that animal is not thinking about us. They're doing something else, and we could be safe. Okay, maybe one or two more questions because it's already 8.30. Okay, next, Raisa. Um, next time, can you take a photo of an ele elephant with a pathetic leg? Oh, next time I will even find it. I have a photo from Sri Lanka of an elephant with a prosthetic leg. So next time I will make sure I bring that photo. Okay. Okay. Yes, Muhammad. If you have any question that you would like to ask, please. Uh, have you ever get hurt in like uh doing one of your photos? Have you ever got hurt by an animal? Or I've, any... I've only been there was a uh, a baby lion that was playing with me and just gave me a little bite. Like if you have a puppy or a cat, sometimes they play with you and they get a little rough. They don't mean to hurt you. So I had a little bite from a playful baby lion. Oh, thanks. Okay, last one, yeah, Almira. Yes, please. Um, when you showed us the lion picture, was the lion trained? Can you say that again a little louder? Uh, when you took the lion picture, was the lion trained? Uh, no, that, that lion was a wild lion, but it, it was resting. It had already eaten, so it was, it was resting. Oh, wow, that's lucky. It's lucky that you didn't get it. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think it's the time is over, so I think uh, you can unmute your microphone and uh, give a big appreciation to Mr. Richards. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Richards. Okay, I think that went well. Okay, we'll be back at... I'll see uh, you in 25 minutes. Yeah, in 25 minutes. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.
powers of social injustice shall be heard. Social injustice, them hide and hush. Sleep on the rock just like dirt and dust. Enggak, it, it, iya itu foto yang gue sama kalau itu kan yang baru kan cuma buat kebutuhan karena belum ada foto kan tapi nanti semua ada seragam standar foto yang oh, mm, yang backgroundnya sama semua murid juga sama jadi naiknya belum oh iya
Halo guys, two more minutes to go ya. <laughs> Pak, Pak, Pak Ahmad, uh, need to look at the list of the student. I mean, the number of uh, audience is 35. Basically, the number of students in year 5 is 52, Pak. Yeah. I need to uh, waiting from other two classes, ya. Oke, ya. Hai, Bu. Itu more minutes, Bu. Ya. Yeah. I will let you know. Okay. I think I need to restart. Nobody can. Yes, Pak Shen. Oh, can you hear me, Pak? Yes, Pak. Yeah, thank you. We are still waiting for more students joining in, Pak. Okay, thanks. It's already nine o'clock, and I think it's already more than 50 students joining in. Maybe you can start now, Pak Shen. Okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're so lucky today. We have a guest speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Mitch, Mr. Richard Sobel. Uh, Richard Sobel is an author of books for children and an award-winning photographer. His books explore whales, elephants, mountain gorillas, African wildlife, environmental conservation, the magic of silkworms, how rice has grown, anchor what, construction sites, and life in an African community. He's recently collaborated with Leonardo DiCaprio, Frank Gerhi, the late Governor Ann Richards, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Also, his photographs appear regularly in publications worldwide, including Time Magazine, The New York Times, Paris Match, Abilon, and National Geographic. We would very much like to say how much we appreciate seeing Mr. Sobel today, and we look forward to his knowledge and expertise shared with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm here in the uh, uh, United States on the East Coast. It's my Wednesday night. Uh, I haven't been outside in the last hour or so, but it's beginning of feeling of winter. It's probably six or seven degrees Celsius now. Um, envious of your climate just now. So. Um, I'm happy to take this opportunity to share some of my photographs and talk a little bit about what goes in to making a book and some of the challenges and decisions that I make as an author. And some of them are probably very similar to the decisions that you have to make if you have a writing assignment or even if you're writing for fun, that as the author, you get to add details and you get to add themes that change the mood and the feeling of what you're writing. So I'm going to share some of that uh, with you. And I just want to start with, uh, you heard that I'm a photographer. 
And the reason that I started making books for students like you is that I have two sons and they're grown up now, but when they were your age, we would read together a lot, particularly at bedtime. And when it was my turn to choose the book, I would pick usually nonfiction and usually books about animals. I would go to the library and find a book about an animal that I wasn't familiar with because in my work, I knew that I was gonna photograph animals and the more I learned, the more I could anticipate their behavior and know whether I had to be there in the morning or the afternoon or just learn as much as I could about the animal. So one time I found a book in the library called Giraffes in the Wild. And I thought, well, I'm going to Africa, this would be helpful. I can learn more about giraffes. I didn't know much. So I opened the book and I look at the first photograph and the book was designed with photos on one page and facts and information on the other. So I looked at the first photograph and there were two tall giraffes and behind them, I saw a wire metal fence. And I went back to the cover and it said giraffes in the wild. And I thought for a second, this is a little strange that I would see a fence, but I kept going. I went to the second page and there was a baby giraffe and the mother. And behind them, I saw power lines and electrical wires. And again, I thought this was a little bit confusing, but I didn't want to make a big deal. My boys just want a story. They don't need dad, the photographer, to analyze every detail for them. So I go to the third page and there were four giraffes as the sun was going down. And I looked behind them and there was a parking lot with cars and buses. So I put that book down, picked up Chronicles of Narnia and continued reading. And then after they went to sleep, I, I, I had to go back to this book to figure out what was happening. And I looked and looked and looked. And in the back of the book, there was a little note that said all of the photographs were made in a zoo. And I didn't think that was right. That very, I found that a little disturbing. So I decided that I was gonna try to make books that were real. And that if I was going to talk about animals or people or different cultures, I couldn't be lazy. And I had to actually go and travel to those places. So I started a series of books called The Traveling photographer. So what I want to do now is share my screen and give you a look into some of the photographs and some of the places that I have traveled. So my work in life as a photographer and a writer and a storyteller has taken me around the world many times. And sometimes my work as a wildlife photographer can get a little interesting. I've been chased by hippos. I've eaten an orange with an orangutan. I've moved close to a mountain gorilla. I've cuddled with bear cubs. I've gazed with gazelles. I've stampeded with stallions. I've locked eyes with a lion. I've paraded with peacocks. I've been splashed by the tail of a whale. I've sat with seals. I've picnicked with pandas. I've run alongside elephants. And sometimes I have to run away for my life. And then I take the time to look at my photographs as stories and narratives 
and I add words to my pictures and publish many of them as books. So there are many reasons that I love to tell stories with photographs. Photographs help me remember the places that I visit and the interesting people that I get to meet. Photographs help me to share different cultures and meet people and talk about people whose lives are so different than mine. Photographs help me to record moments of nature. And beauty. I started working and traveling to Kenya now to make a book about rhinos, an animal that is extremely endangered as they've been hunted until they're almost close to extinction, particularly the northern white rhinos. And I got to meet a very special rhino named Sudan. Sudan is the last remaining male northern white rhino on earth. He represents the end of a species. It's as if we can see extinction for a brief moment before our eyes. Sudan is gentle and he was quite quiet and welcoming, even to me. And although I have many cameras and believe it's important to have good equipment, I tend to travel light. And this is not my style. I like to travel much lighter. And again, when I photograph animals, this isn't my style either. I think most animals are smarter than this. And they're certainly more smarter than this. So photographs have the ability to convey emotions, locations, and messages. I didn't take this photograph. I wish I had. But I like it so much because it tells an entire story in one single image. I'm sure it's a setup and it wasn't a natural moment. There's probably some Photoshop manipulation and not a random lucky moment. But the idea of composing all the elements of a little story into one image is quite brilliant. So when I make a new book as a storyteller, I have to think about what it is I want to show. My books always have a story. They're not just photos and a list of facts. So I get to decide, do I want it to be funny or scary or maybe happy or sad? So the shaping and editing of the story are important as the skills that I use to make the photographs in the first place. So I want to show you a work in progress, an example of a new story for a book I'm making now. And I call it Monkey Zone. It's about a town where monkeys live. So as the author, I can choose photos that may make this story a little bit creepy, a little dark and empty. Maybe a little bit scary as the monkeys take over. And I don't show any people. I show a place that looks like the monkeys have invaded. And they've driven all the people out. And it's filled with hungry monkeys. as they take over the town 
and meet in the gang. So for me as a storyteller, I collect all this information, all this raw material, and then I'm in control of what story I want to tell. So now I showed you this kind of creepy, dark version of Monkey Zone. And now I want to show you another way that I could tell the story. So remember, I made all the photographs at the same time in the same location, but I could make two different stories by choosing different photos. This time, I want to make the story a little more fun, a little more colorful. And one way that I can do that is by adding people. And I can show a monkey who even tried to steal my tripod. And in this version of the story, the monkeys accept treats. And they eat and drink. I can even show monkeys playing together. And visiting a salad bar. Or playing with other monkeys. And coming to a special party. And of course, there's time for a bath. So in this case, I try to make the story more happy and fun and upbeat. So that's one of my jobs to edit and choose and change the mood and the theme. So when I start up to make a book, I don't always know what I'm getting into. But one thing I love is elephants. And I've already made four books about elephants. So I'm always looking for new elephant stories. Can you imagine an elephant as a pet? Or having an elephant in your own backyard? In most in neighborhoods, elephants are way too big and eat much too much for anybody to keep at home. And most of us don't have elephants living in our gardens or driveways. But a few lucky people do have their very own elephants. In a small vill village in Thailand, there are friendly elephants walking around freely, coming and going as they please. Here, people and elephants live all together. Visitors travel to this place called Bantaplong from all over the world to watch and even ride on these smart and strong elephants. So many of the people in this village of Bantaplong devote their lives to caring for these elephants and training them so they can welcome those guests and show off their intelligence and talents. One night, a gifted elephant trainer named Pai woke up to hear his elephant, Double Gold, howling. Her moans woke up all the elephants in the village, and all the elephants started to roar. The town was wild with noise. Pai had watched Double Gold grow bigger and bigger for almost two years, and he knew that she was ready to add a new baby to his family. But little did he know how big his family would become. Double Gold roared until a healthy baby elephant was born. And then she laid her head down, exhausted. But then a few minutes later, Double Gold lifted her body and pierced the quiet sunrise with another loud howl. What was going on? Elephants usually only had one baby. 
All of a sudden, another elephant was born. Twins. Here in this small village, the only known pair of boy elephant twins in the entire world had just been born. No one had ever seen twins before. After a few minutes of shock, Pi began laughing with joy, and soon everyone else joined in, cheering and whooping and hollering together as they all celebrated the miracle of the only two boy twin elephants in the whole wide world. As they celebrated, the warm rays of morning sunlight seemed to turn the whole town gold. And so these two boys got their names, Gold Light and Gold Ray. I had been to this village many times before to make a book called Elephant in the Backyard. And Pi asked me if I wanted to do a book about his new family. And of course I said, yes, yes, double yes, twins, yes. I never expected to be the official baby photographer for the world's only boy elephant twins. But there I was watching them grow up. Every morning, the brothers drink gallons and gallons of their mom's milk before they go off to elephant nursery school. And now they are one year old. The twins need a lot of care and loving. And they're very active and very different elephants. Pi trains the twins every day. So when they grow up, they can show off for the visitors that come to their village. They go to school to learn how to move and turn left and right and stop and go at Pi's command. Like so many twins, it's really hard to tell them apart. They are such different little boys. All through the hot day, Pi brings them buckets of cool water. Gold Ray sips slowly and carefully, while Gold Light takes huge gulps and slurps and burps while he drinks. Gold Ray loves to follow Pi's voice and proudly sits, stands, or rolls over. But Gold Light would rather be playing, and he tugs on his brother every chance he gets. Sometimes he even steps on his brother's belly. Gold Ray may seem calm and serious, but he is fast. And when the two boys take their daily run, Gold Ray leaves his slow-poke brother behind in the dust. And then to brag a bit, Gold Ray rubs his nose in Gold Light's face. Elephants have very rough, thick skin that's wrinkly and dotted with wiry black hairs. Bugs and insects like to crawl into their skin, which can make them very uncomfortable and itchy. At least twice a day, the twins come down to the river to swim. Swimming and snorting and climbing over each other as all that water helps to clean out those big bunches of bugs that live deep in their folds and wrinkles. Gold light and gold ray splash and spray and point their trunks like squirt guns. And when Pi leads them out of the water, they're very clean and shiny. But not for long. They roll in the dirt again. What a mess. But that, hey, that's what elephants like to do, especially these baby boys. Double Gold is a very good mother. She teaches them how to behave and be kind to one another. And when the boys play too rough or start fighting, she slips her long trunk between them and pushes one away. They're still learning just how strong their long trunks can be and how much power they have in their round, chubby bodies. Sometimes when the boys are playing, they knock each other over by accident. But mom is always right there, 
coming in and making sure everything is all right. And they always snuggle and make up. In the afternoon, when it is especially hot, Double Gold sprays herself with a cloud of red dirt. She shows her boys how a shower of dust can help keep them cool. The dirty crust is like an elephant's sunblock, protecting them from the harsh light. And the boys love the dust shower. It's one of the only time their mom encourages them to get messy. Gold light and gold ray are learning and getting smarter every day. Their constant climbing and bumping and chasing and running and pushing is all part of growing up and learning how to be good elephants. At the end of each long day, they take a last walk. And then the twins lay down for sleep, snuggling under the stars. Their two trunks twisted together, softly snoring with sweet songs. But there's still time for some mischief. Gold Ray lays down, so ready for nightlight. But Gold Light plops down right on top of his brother, using Gold Ray's warm backside as a giant pillow. But soon the twins cuddle together and fall fast asleep. Good night, elephant twins. Good night. Thank you for being such good watchers and listeners. And we have some time, so I'd be happy to hear your comments or take any questions you might have. Okay. If you like to raise your hand for a question. And Thomas has a question. Go ahead, Thomas. Have you ever tried to take in a picture of a reptile, say, like a, a crocodile or an alligator? I have, in fact, photographed both of those. I haven't studied them in depth, but I have encountered them in various travels, and, and I, have, um, I have indeed made some photographs of them. Maybe in my next presentation, I'll try to add one. All right. Matthias, go ahead. Um, sorry, um, how did you know there were elephants in that village where there were two twin um, elephants? Like, how did you know? I, I had worked in that, in that village before, and I was not there for the birth, so the birth was a surprise. So they weren't uh, aware that they were going to be twins. So I first met the twins when they were just two months old. And then I followed them on and off for the next 18 months. So I wish I had been there at birth, but that was a surprise and there was no way to be there uh, to anticipate that miracle. Gregor, go ahead. Uh, I have two questions. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, when you were with the twins for around 18 months, if I'm not wrong, did you adapt the living, the lifestyle of the people in that village? I, I, I you know, when I'm in a place, I do like to um, know more about the culture. So I did eat the, eat the local foods and I did uh, stay in a guest house where, with a little mattress on the floor. So I, I didn't commute to a five-star resort with a swimming pool. I did stay with the local people. I see. And another question, what is your favorite animal? I really like big animals. So I like the elephants, which are the largest of the land animals. And I like the mountain gorillas, which are the largest of the primates. And I love the whales, which is the largest of all the animals. And I live um, in a place called Cape Cod, which is a, a, a stick of land, like a finger of land that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. 
And in my summer months in uh, June, July, August, September, a lot of humpback whales come to visit here. I see, thank you. Tahi Kim, go ahead. How many years have you been taking pictures? I, I started in university and art school and I just kept going. So my whole professional life, um, adult life, I've been taking pictures. Sebastian? <clears throat> okay, so are you gonna come to the school again? I would love to meet you all in person. So let us hope that that day will come and our borders will be open and you will all be present and uh, we can we can do more in-depth workshops together. All right. Shalia, go ahead. Have you ever go to Indonesia? Actually, yes, I've been uh, several times because I've been photographing orangutan. So I've come to Kalimantan and hope to do oh, a book yeah. about the orangutan as well. Thank you. Moni? So when you um, took photos of the monkey, um, was the monkey dangerous or was they were very kind? Sometimes the animals can be dangerous, but when I travel, I always have somebody like Pi, the elephant trainer. I always have somebody who knows the behavior of those animals, and that person is my guide and looks out for me and makes sure that I'm safe. Like, for example, I might be in Africa and I might see a lion and I might want to get close to that lion. So I want to have somebody with me who's going to say, wait a minute, that's a hungry lion. Let's find you a lion who already ate. And that will be a safer place for you to be. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've got time. There's two more questions from people who haven't asked before. So I'm going to go for Tony and then Kindamara. Okay, go ahead, Tony. Where was your favorite place you go? Can you say that again a little louder? Um, where was your favorite place to go? I have many favorite places, but I do particularly like um, East Africa. I've done a lot of work in Uganda and Kenya, and and I love your part of the world. I do love um, I do love Asia, so I would uh, love to come back to to Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Kindamara, go ahead. How many books have you published so far? I have finished seventeen books for students your age, and then I've done two books for adults. And I usually, it takes a long time, maybe two or three years to start and finish a book. So I usually have two or three works in progress, like the like Monkey Zone is a book that hopefully I'll be done with, and the book about the rhinos. Um, those are works in progress that might come out in the next year or two. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, Mr. Sobel. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to your story. And what I thought was inspiring for me was the way that you use, Im you use images to create a narrative and the way that you switch the narrative by putting the pictures in certain order will probably ins has inspired me for next week because we're tuning into a new unit, which is about uh, natural resources. And the way that you put those images together can make us think of different uh, positive and negative ways. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for being able to answer our students' questions. And we know that your books are going to fit with our unit. So it's time for us to go shopping. Thanks so much for having me and for all your wonderful questions. You're welcome. We hope to see you again in real life. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Okay, guys, time to get ready for snack. So let's uh, yes, let's, let's get line ready up, please. Okay, that was great, wasn't it? Wow, so cool. I, I agreed, Pak Shane. I loved how he told the story with two. To, same story with two different perspectives. I love that. I thought that was fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That okay. was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Have a great snack time. Bye. 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 Bye.
थैंक यू बाय